بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعم نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد So we are on our 19th session of Hell Revealed and the discussion today is a continuation of what we ended up with last time which was a discussion about coming to and approaching the hellfire which everybody will have to do as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in the Quran wa in minkum illa wariduha every one of you will surely come upon it or cross it or come to it so there's, to be honest, I mean, from all of the narrations that we've been looking at and the verses of the Quran, I would probably say that the amount of narrations and things which have been transmitted and related and mentioned regarding approaching the hellfire uh, on the day of judgment, after the judgment day when people will have to proceed, whether to the fire or whether to paradise, we will have to go over hellfire. So the discussion about that and the number of narrations regarding that are probably the most abundant. Uh, we could probably spend two entire sessions discussing just those narrations, but they, most of them say very similar things, but they've been transmitted from so many different Sahaba and Tabi'een and, and so on. So that's why I, I can't, I mean, they're mostly saying similar things. I'm only trying to mention to you uh, new bits of information or new perspective that it provides on that event. So, for today, we've got a hadith uh, that the Prophet sallallahu from Ubaid ibn Umair, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the causeway upon Jahannam is like the edge of a sword and on the two sides of it are thorns and hooks and anchors and so on, people will embark upon this bridge to try to cross it and then they will be gripped, they will be attacked, they will have to try to essentially avoid the thorns and everything else on the side. So in terms of how severe or how dangerous these anchors and hooks and these other contraptions, whatever they are, I mean, they've been described as hooks or anchors or whatever, but I think that's just to give somebody some kind of idea, a reference point based on what we have available in this world. The contraptions of the hereafter are going to be very different. They're going to be huge. And we've read before that they're going to be quite smart in terms of what they, who they are after. Who they are after. So then in this case, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, by the one in whose, whose hand is my soul, one, just one of those hooks, one of those hooks will be used to seize more than the number of people who are part of the Rabi'a and the Mudar tribes. These are big tribes, the Rabi'a and the Mudar tribes are large tribes. So their members, whatever that number is, a huge number, there's more than that amount uh, of people that each one of those hooks will be after. So that just gives you an understanding of how hard those hooks will be working as such. May Allah protect us from that. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim now from Aisha radiallahu anha. She asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where will people be? Where exactly at what instance and where are people going to be when Allah says, يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ The day when the earth is going to be changed to a different earth. The land is going to be changed to something that you don't recognize. It's going to be something different. Likewise, the heavens, everything would have changed. It's going to be a massive cosmic change. Where are people going to be exactly? Where, what is that referring to? So the Prophet ﷺ said, that's the time when people are going to be walking over the causeway. 
is going to just look, everything is going to look so different. There's also another narration in Sahih Muslim from Thawban, radiyallahu anhu, that a rabbi from among the Yahud, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where will people be? Yawma tubaddul ardu ghayr al ard wa samawat. Where will people be when the earth changes? He said, they're going to be in a darkness. They're going to be covered in darkness just before the bridge, just before the causeway. So then he asked, who's the first that's going to get across that? So the Prophet ﷺ responded, it's going to be the needy muhajireen, the weak and needy muhajireen. The weakest will get across easiest because they had good deeds. The weakest who had good deeds will get across uh, because they have less tax filing to do. They have less accounts to worry about. They didn't have much, so they just would get by. Just like in this world, they don't even have to file taxes. The poor don't file taxes, right? Because they make less than the threshold. So these are, and then specifically from among the poor people, it's actually those who will be from the muhajireen, the emigrators, then the others. Now, we've got two narrations here, both from Sahih Muslim. One says that Yawm al-Tubaddul ardu ghayr al is actually going to be when people are on the causeway, when they're trying to pass over. Others are speaking about when they're before that. It's the launching ground, the launching pad before that. So that's why the author says that the way to reconcile between these narrations is that they're both part of the same ordeal. You start off before, so that part's going to be dark as well. And the bridge is going to be, there's going to be darkness there as well. And when a person is actually up, uh, in that space before they, just like anywhere else, before you get onto the bridge, there's a part where the bridge uh, starts from. That area, uh, the launching area as such, says that that is actually going to be the place where light will be distributed. Because on the Day of Judgment, eventually things are going to be very dark and light is only going to be coming from the deeds that a person has done. So that's the part where the, the light is going to be divided according to the deeds. That's also when the earth will change, uh, when it will become almost like something else. So if you get light, that will then extend for you onto the bridge, onto the causeway, and you'll be able to get across it. So one of the things is that if you do have light on that day, it means that you will probably across, get across, across the bridge. Now, people are going to be divided at that time. Um, there's a whole discussion now about how people are going to be divided at that time in terms of getting across the bridge and who's going to have to go across, who's going to even make an effort to go across, and others who are just going to fall in. So he's saying that people are going to be divided among those who are, who are believers, worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and did not do any shirk at all, who did not ascribe any partners to him. Then there's going to be a second group of those who are polytheists. They were ascribing people, uh, they were ascribing others to Allah and were devoted to others with Allah. So those, they're just not going to get across the bridge anyway. They don't even get to cross the bridge. They're going to fall straight forward inside. They don't even go to the part where the bridge begins. They're just going to fall. There's probably a ramp for them or something like that before the bridge begins. So there's, it seems like there's going to be a part where you can get across the bridge. There's going to be another part which probably just goes down into hellfire because below is hellfire. And he says that this is indicated by a hadith which Bukhari and Muslim have transmitted from Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the people will be gathered Allah will gather people on the Day of Judgment and say that whoever used to worship anything, they should go and find that thing and follow it. Whatever you worship, you can go ahead and find that thing and just follow that. Because you worshipped it thinking it's going to save you, so go ahead. So, the sun will be followed by those who were worshippers of the sun. The moon will be followed by the, those who followed the moon. And then all of these other idols and so on, they will also be there, and they will suddenly attract all of their followers. Now, who's left then? Everybody who used to follow whoever, they've gone to their leaders, to their objects of worship. 
then there's only going to be this ummah left and the munafiqeen. The hypocrites are going to be left with the true believers. Carries on and then he mentions then that the causeway will, uh, the causeway will be uh, put across the hellfire and I and my ummah will be the first to cross it. So we've got that much, but there's uh, still some ambiguity about the munafiqeen. So now the another narration here, which is in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari again from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that on the day of judgment, there's going to be an announcer. Somebody will make an announcement that every group should go and follow whatever he used to worship. Go ahead. Right? So nobody's going to left and nobody's going to be left among those who used to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, that means all the idols, uh, and, and so on and so forth, they will just go and they'll all just essentially slip down into hellfire. Now, who's left? This one gives a bit more detail. Only those are left who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they were good or bad, meaning whether they were sinners or very, very righteous people, but they used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sinful believers will be there as well. And there will be some leftovers of the Ahlul Kitab as well, those who had pure worship among them. So now the Yahud will be called and it's saying it will be asked to them that what did you used to worship? So those among them who used to say that we used to worship Uzair, Ezra, right? Ibnullah as the son of Allah, it'll be said to him that you lied because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't have a companion, a spouse, nor did he have a child. So what do you want? What exactly do you want today? They'll ask them that question, they'll say that we're very, very thirsty, our Lord, so give us something to drink. So it will be, a command will be given about them, and it will be said, will you not go in? Will you not go? So they will eventually be gathered towards the hellfire, and that hellfire will seem like a sarab, a, a mirage. And it will feel like there's a lot of water there, like a mirage, and they will essentially uh, one after another because of the extreme thirst. They'll think it's water and they'll just head right down into the hellfire. Then similar, the Nasara, the Nazarenes, the Christians, they will be asked the same thing and they'll say, we used to worship M Masih, Isa, Isa alayhi salam, son of Allah. They'll be said to them the same thing that you are lie, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't have a wife or child or children, right? And then the same thing, what do you want? They say, we want uh, water as well and then the hellfire will be shown as water for them and they'll go in as well according to this narration. Now, those who are left, as we said in the previous narration, are those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they've been good or bad in that sense. The Lord of the worlds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will come to them in a different form to what they could recognize as Him being Allah. They've probably never seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but with the descriptions mentioned of who Allah is, not necessarily physical, because we don't have any physical descriptions of Allah. There is no physical description. When you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to be kind of a transcendent uh, vision anyway. But whatever they're shown then does not look like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to them. So they're going to be asked, what are you waiting for? Every ummah has followed whatever he used to worship. What are you waiting for? So they would say, our Lord, we separated from the people in the world. We did not essentially do what they did in terms of following false deities and false objects of worship. And even though, you know, we could have benefited from being with them and, uh, and so on, but we did not become their companions. So then whatever this object, whatever this sighting is, will say to them that I am your Lord. And they will say, Na'udhu Billahi Mink. We seek refuge in Allah from you calling yourself God. What is this? You can't be God. We're never going to ascribe any partners to Allah. We avoided it in the world. How are we going to do that this time? Twice or thrice they will say this. So then he's going to ask a question. He's going to say, do you have a sign that you could recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by? This will be all intuitive based on your faith. Based on a person's faith, they will uh, be able to distinguish between who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Because remember, we're promised that we will see Allah in the hereafter. So they will say, yes, we have a sign. And then, as Allah mentions in the Qur'an, فَيُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقِ 
when the shin will be revealed. Now that's a very, very complicated statement to understand. It's a metaphor. It's a, it's a, it's a ambiguous statement as to what exactly it refers to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the best. But essentially what is described then is that when that happens, there'll be nobody left. Now remember, the munafiqeen are still with the Muslims at this point. Right? They're considered disobedient. Right? So everybody else is gone. Only the believers are there or those who profess to be believers. So now it says that when this event will take place, whatever that is, anybody that used to make sujood and just prostrate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by himself with their willpower, you know, for sincere reasons, they will be able to prostrate. Meaning it will be such an incredible experience of that vision that you will just want to prostrate down. See, when people get really excited with Allah subhanahu, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they really feel that love erupting in their hearts, maybe because they've received something or whatever and they want to do a, sh- a sajda to shukr. So it's going to be that only those who used to pray before and who used to bow and prostrate before will be given permission to do this. May Allah grant us that permission as well on that day. Anybody who used to do it just to show others that they're believers, but they were not really believers and they used to just show just to kind of demonstrate to people that I'm a believer, their backbones, their backbones, their spinal, their spinal, their spine will be fused together and become like a pillar. They do those surgeries today as well. If somebody, you know, for people who can't really look after themselves too much and they're flopping around all over the place, something just fuse them together so at least they can look like they sit up all the time. They won't be able to prostrate, they won't be able to bend. There'll be no flexibility in their body. Every time that they try to prostrate, just to show as they used to do in the world, they will just fall flat on their face. They won't be able to bend, they'll just fall flat on their face. Now, when they raise their heads, and then they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the beatific vision will occur. They'll see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what they expected to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will recognize him. And he will say, I am your Lord. And they will say, yes, you are our Lord. And then after that, that causeway will be placed in above Jahannam. And then they will be told to move along. So, this hadith now from Sahih Bukhari Muslim tells us very clearly that anybody who expressed that they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, anybody who expressed the worship for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether that was Isa alayhi salam or Uzair or whatever it is, they're going to essentially have the same ending as the mushrikeen, right? They're going to have the same ending as the mushrikeen in the sense that they don't get to go over the bridge, To get to paradise, you have to go over the bridge. They're going to essentially fall into the hellfire. Except that the worshippers of the idols and the sun and the moon and other planets and whatever else there were, uh, other mushrikeen, they would fall into the hellfire along with their objects of worship as well. Initially, right from the beginning. Now, we get an idea of this in Surah Hud in the Quran, verse 98, where Allah says, about Pharaoh, right? About Pharaoh, those who used to worship the Pharaoh. Because he used to, he says, Ana rabbukum al-a'la. He says, I am your highest Lord, he used to say. يَقْدُمُ قَوْمَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَأَوْرَدَهُمُ النَّارِ وَبِئْسَ الْوِرْدُ الْمَوْرُودِ He will come ahead of his people on the Day of Judgment, and he will cause them to also enter into hellfire. And what a bad place to enter it is. That shows you that that is going to happen to all of them. Now, those who used to worship Isa Salam and Uzair among the Ahlul Kitab, they're going to, because they had some prophet that they were related to, they don't go in straight away. They're in the second category, right? But they're eventually going to end up in the same place as well. Now, the question here is that, okay, it's going to be said that go and find whoever used to worship and follow them, and then they're going to take them into hellfire, right?
right? So we can understand idols and so on, and the sun and moon and whatever, right? But what about those who used to worship Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, and Uzair, are they going to enter hellfire? Because he's saying that they're going to go with whoever their objects of worship are. So what's going on here? Is Isa alayhi salam going to be used to take people to hellfire? No. So there's a few opinions, uh, a few uh, narrations about this. One is, there's another narration which says that it, it won't be Isa alayhi salam, it'll actually be a shaitan. It'll be his shaitan that will be there doing that job and seeming like it's Isa alayhi salam and they'll think of him as Isa alayhi salam, so they'll follow him. Likewise with Uzair alayhi salam. Uh, another narration mentions that there'll be an angel that will be made to do this task for them, to just come in the form of Jesus, peace be upon him, and Uzair, and, and so on. So the only people left after that are the people who used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, who used to say they used to, that's the munafiqeen. So the munafiqeen carry on until they, they cannot make sujood. Right? That's when they get distinguished. And then the nur, the light is distributed because you need light to proceed in the hereafter on the day of judgment. So the light is only given to the believers. Now the Quran speaks about that in great detail, the distribution of the light and then these munafiqeen asking for light. So now the question is, even among the early scholars as to whether the munafiqeen will get no light at all right from the beginning or they'll be given a light in the beginning to make them feel a bit excited and then after that it actually won't work afterwards. It's almost like okay everybody gets a torch but then only the torch of the believer works not the munafiqeen because they won't have any batteries inside. So will they be given a light in the beginning and then it'll just go off? Uh, or will it be that they won't even give, be given any light at all? The first opinion is that no, they will not be given any light at all. And that, we understand this from one narration uh, from Abu Umama, who says that people will be overcome by a very severe darkness on the Day of Judgment. Like, eventually they won't be able to see what's going on. Initially the sun's going to be very close. That initial part, everybody can see what's going on and so on, but eventually will come a time when that sun will be gone, and that's probably the time when Yawma Tubaddar Lardu Ghayr Lard, where the earth is totally changed now, there's no sun, it's absolute darkness. Then the light will be distributed, and the light comes from your deeds. So the believer will be given a light, the disbeliever and the munafiq will not be given anything according to this one. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An Nur, verse 40, أو كظلمات في بحر اللجي يغشاه موج من فوقه موج من فوقه سحاب ظلمات بعضها فوق بعض إذا أخرج يده لم يكد يراها ومن لم يجعل الله له نورا فما له من نور Oh, it's going to be the like, like the darknesses, or it is like the darknesses in an ocean that is full of tumultuous waves. Imagine you're in the middle of an ocean, it's overcast, huge storm has brewed, and there's just one wave which has overcome the second wave. So it's wave upon wave upon wave. I mean, that gets really dark. And above that are dark clouds. So these are darknesses in one another, above one another. That it's so dark that even if you put out your hand, you can hardly see it. That's how dark it is. There's no small bits of light, you know, from your phone, even a notification light, there's no light at all. You can hardly even see your own hand. Now that's really, because generally, even if it's the darkest place, you can generally eventually, the, the eye, mashallah, Allah has given some ability, right, to take some of the light that you can and kind of make out things, even, even an outline, but here you can't. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end, whoever Allah does not designate any light for, they will not have any light. So the disbelievers and the hypocrites will not be able to benefit from the light of the believers as well. Just like a blind person cannot use a person who can see, he can't use his sight in any way. 
unless he follows him. Yes. That's why in Surah Al-Hadid now, in verse 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتُ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا ذُرُونَا نَقْتَبِسْ مِن نُورِكُمْ قِيلَ ارْجِعُوا وَرَاءَكُمْ فَالْتَمِسُوا نُورًا the day when the disbelieving men and women will say to those who believe, at least look at us, unthuruna, look at us, so we can at least take some of your light. It's almost like a blind person saying, hold on, hold on, let me hold on to you, or let me at least follow your voice. But there they can see, but there's no light. So they're saying, let us see by your light. If you've got a torch and you're using it for yourself, it's not like I can't see it, because light, you can't conceal light just for yourself. So it's almost like this is like night vision goggles almost or something like that where only you can benefit. So if you're looking through a night vision goggles, it can't benefit the person next to you. But if you've got a torch, it can benefit the person next to you because he can take from that light, that light spreads. So it seems almost like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But then it'll say, can we take some of yours? But then it will be said, no, no, you go turn around, go behind you and you look for your own light. So then this is described as that kind of deception on that day because the munafiqeen used to deceive people in the world by saying that they're believers and making themselves out to be people of faith. So this is going to be their deception. That's why in Surah An-Nisa 140, uh, 142 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَهُوَ خَادِعُهُمْ They are thinking they're deceiving Allah, but actually Allah is deceiving them. So, they will return back to the place where the lights were essentially distributed. The night vision goggles or whatever it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to provide. فَلَا يَجِدُونَ شَيْئًا They're not going to find anything there. So, they will turn back to the believers. But as in mentioned in Surah Al-Hadid, verse 13 to 15, Allah says, فَضُرِبَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِسُورِ اللَّهُ بَابٍ بَاطِنُهُ فِيهِ الرَّحْمَةُ وَظَاهِرُهُ مِنْ قِبَلِهِ الْعَذَابِ Now, they can't even talk to the believers. They can't see them because there is a veil. There's a, a barrier placed between them. There is a door. There is an access point. But problem is that on the other side, there's mercy. That's they want to get to, but they can't get to that. But the apparent part of it, that is where the punishment is. That's where they're going to have to be. Then Allah says, وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ And what a bad place to be. That's why Sulaim mentions that the disbeliever, sorry, the munafiqeen, uh, the, you see for the disbelievers, it's going to be very clear what their state is. For the munafiqeen, they almost like have some hope that because they were with the believers, they're going to go along with them. So for a while they are, they seem to be going along with them, but that's their deception. Until when the light is distributed, then they can go no further. That's what it seems like. Now, I know that the munafiqeen are supposed to be the worst of them all. But if you look at it a dis different way, and this is no benefit at all, but if you look at it one way, that at least because they acted like believers, they get to come with the believers a bit more. But that's no incentive to be a munafiq. It just shows that the belief has value. That's all I want to try to highlight from there, if that's a way to understand that. The second point is that no, Allah will actually give them a light in the beginning to add to their deception or their false you know, hopes uh, and get their uh, excitement going a bit. That they will be given light first and then after that they, they will not have any. This is because they used to be with the believers in the, in the world. So when they get very excited, it's going to be extinguished. And this was the opinion of Mujahid and a number of others because Ibn Abbas, it's related from him, radiallahu anhu, that laysa ahadu min ahli tawheed illa yu'ta nuran yawm al qiyamah. Right? Um, every person of, uh, who declared the one, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're going to have a light on the day of judgment. As far as the, the hypocrite is, his light is going to be extinguished. So that seems like they're going to get some light first. Now, when the, dis when the hypocrite's light is extinguished, the believers are going to get scared. Because that's such a day that you just don't know what's going to happen. You're really excited that you've got light, they've got light, their light has been extinguished. You think you're going to lose your light as well. 
So then they're going to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as mentioned by Allah in the Quran, Surah Al-Tahreem, verse 8. يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا أَتْمِمْ لَنَا نُورَنَا وَغْفِلْ لَنَا إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Our Lord, complete our light for us. Complete our light for us. Like, let, it, let us do what we need to do with our light. Don't, don't end it for us. May Allah make us among the believers. Keep us among the believers. Right, another narration from Hassan mentions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that every believer on the day of judgment will be given a light. Every munafiq will also be given a light and they'll start to walk with it. However, when we get to the sirat, that causeway, it's going to be overcome with a lot of darkness. And that's when the munafiq and the hypocrite's light is going to be extinguished, but the believer's light will continue to shine. That's when the believer will, con- will pray to Allah saying, Our Lord, atmim lana nurana, allow our light to be completed and forgive us. You have ability over everything. We've already read a number, had uh, a lot of narrations before which we discussed, which made it very clear that people are going to, where do people or how much light is everybody going to be given? Everybody's given enough light or light according to their good deeds in this world. So the greater the deed, the better goggles you get, the better you'll be able to see, the better night vision you get, if that light is a night vision. The more the deeds, the better night vision. That's also going to contribute to how fast we get across the across that bridge, which is mentioned earlier. How how much with how much luxury and speed and quickness we can get over the bridge. There were narrations of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu and radiallahu anhu about that. Now there's going to be some people who will go very slow over that bridge. So he's going to say, Ya Rabbi, lima batta'ta bi? Why are you making it so slow for me? Like why couldn't I go fast like others? So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that it's not me that slowed you down. It's your deeds that slowed you down. So it's all based on the deeds. That's why Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali rahimahullah, he mentions that the iman our faith, strength of our faith, and also our good deeds in the dunya, they are essentially a reflection of that causeway in the hereafter. And istiqama in the world is a reflection of how we'll be able to tread in the hereafter on that causeway. If we've been able to be quite steadfast in this world without wavering too much, you know, like sometimes becoming very religious, like in Ramadan, and then after that, just losing it, and then you hear a good lecture or something, and then you, you're okay for a while, you go for Umrah, you're okay for a while, and then you mess up again big time. That's just wavering all over the place. Then consider that's, gonna be like a re- that's going to be the state on that bridge as well. It may get across because you did hold on to the faith, but it's just going to be really, really dangerous, right? So Allah give us istiqama, it's not easy, but Allah give us istiqama. Uh, that means steadfastness. Uh, it also depends on how much we keep asking Allah for steadfastness, uh, both in this world and the hereafter. So it depends on all of these things. So then Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali says that whoever kept his path straight and his travel straight, when he was driving, he was driving properly, not going here and there both in terms of his outer expression of the faith, salat and fasting and everything else, and also his inner state, right? So both of this matters, both of this will be reflected. Then that is how it's going to become in the hereafter on that bridge in Jah- uh, over Jahannam as well. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. So if we've been overcome by... Uh, different uh, unlawful desires, unworthy things, distractions, then those things are going to come in the form of those hooks and anchors and sharp objects and contraptions in the hereafter to essentially distract us from getting across just like it was in this world as well. We ask Allah for protection. We ask Allah for protection. There's 
a report which mention, mentions that Jahannam has seven causeways over it, pathways over it. Some of them have been discussed as well, uh, maybe for different types of people. Now, one of them, interestingly, there's a few things that have been spelled out here. One of them is the bridge of amana, the bridge of trustworthiness, honesty. If a person has been honest, that bridge is going to let you cross. And if a person has not been honest, then that bridge is not going to let you cross. It's going to make it very, very difficult depending on the level of dishonesty. Honesty is, uh, 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 let me just mention the others. The second one is going to be the one related to kinship. Rahim. So it's saying that amana and rahim are going to be ala jambay sirat. Kinship. If you've been good with your family members. And I think these are two very, very important factors in human life and social cohesion and social life of believers. Kinship, it has to start at home with your own family. If there's destruction and chaos within the family, there's going to be chaos in the community because communities and societies are made up of individual families. So that's the first thing. Number two, in order for the world to work in a predictable and a decent way, in an honorable and dignified way, you need honesty. A lot of what we're seeing is dishonesty. A lot of what we've seen in the last 20 years and events of recent times, it's been a lot of dishonesty. And dishonesty just doesn't work in the world. It only works for a short amount of time. It just creates chaos and chaos for people for, for some time and eventually the truth prevails. So it's that kind of a thing. Those two things are very important for human life in this world. Family kinship, Maintaining the ties of kinship. And number two, amana. According to some narration, it seems like there's going to be three stages. If you can get over the amana part, then you can get over the kinship part, then there's going to be the third part. So it says that the first one is about salat. If the salat was fine, that, that's good. Then it's going to ask you, then the next one, next phase is amana. If you succeed in that, then it's going to be about the kinship. Succeeding that you're across, otherwise it's going to be problems. Allah make it easy. Imam Abu Dawood has a narration from Anas al-Juhani that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever accused a Muslim of something that he wanted to, you can say, disgrace him by. Right? Whoever accused a Muslim of something with a view to disgrace him. Right? Not, not like an honest accusation because of something wrong, but here it, the purpose is just to disgrace them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will block them, uh, cons- confine them on that bridge of Jahannam until he can extract himself from this, either by seeking forgiveness, which is probably not going to come, uh, or by giving their good deeds away or, or, or taking some sins or whatever it is. Another version says that whoever accuses a believer of that which he has no knowledge of, just makes up something about someone, Allah will prevent and block him right on that bridge until he can extract himself from what he used to say. Abu Muslim al-Khawlani, rahimahullah, used to say to his wife, Abu Muslim, so his wife is Ummu, Ummu Muslim. Their child's name was probably Muslim, so, right. Should the rahlak get your, it's almost like saying, prepare your car. That's what we would say today, like get ready for the trip. Should the rahlak, essentially means get your animal and your, your package, your, your, your luggage and everything together for your journey. Because there's going to be nobody to help to get you across the bridge of Jahannam. Get your own supplies together. Right? There's not going to be nobody to provide supplies on that day to get you across. It's going to be your own supplies. Muhammad ibn Sammak says, I heard a man among the ascetics of the people of Basra saying, 
Now, this gives us an idea of how long this bridge is. We've not come across that, right? We heard about how thin it is and how razor sharp it is and so on, how complicated it is, but now it tells us, very, there's various opinions mentioned here, but this one says th it's like a 3,000-year journey. 1,000 years to climb up, 1,000 years at the pinnacle. So it's almost like goes up, goes straight, and then goes back down. That's not a suspension bridge. They are pretty straight. This is a different kind of bridge. There's other versions. It's long. It's long. We just ask Allah to give us deeds to help us over that. However, as I said, it's a smart bridge. So that's why we've got another narration from Abu Hilal who says that it's reached us that the sirat for some people is going to be thinner than a hair. But for other people, it's going to be like an expanded valley. You, got, you can essentially um, go very easily. Sahal al-Tustari, he says that the path of this dunya, the path of iman in this dunya is very, very difficult for. Meaning, they were so focused on the hereafter that they would, they would have struggles, essentially. Because the religion is a struggle to a certain degree. For them, it will, the path will be expanded for them. And whoever the path of this world is expanded for, they have no restrictions, they do as they please, then it's going to be very, very, very restricted in the hereafter. Essentially what he says, the meaning of this is that whoever constrains themselves in, the, in this world to follow the commands of Allah and avoid the prohibitions, then that is essentially what steadfastness in this world is. What else is steadfastness? That's going to uh, be rewarded with expansiveness in the hereafter. And likewise, in this world, whoever just enjoys, commits the haram, goes where he likes, does the wrong, involves himself in haram deeds and actions and deals and so on, then it's going to be tough for them in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah to Maryam, verse 7172, Every one of you is going to come to it, go across it. This is the, this is the hellfire. This is, uh, this is a, a final assured uh, decision and decree from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, but we will then grant safety to do, those who, f who are fearful. But those who are oppressive, we're going to leave them in there. So once, Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu, the famous Sahabi, he started crying. His wife started crying. So he asked her, why are you crying for? What's made you cry? She says, well, I saw you crying, so I started crying. What a connection they had. Right? So he said, well, the reason I cried is because I remember this verse. And I realized that I am going to be one of them as well. Because if everybody has to do it, I'm one of them. I have to go across it as well. And I don't know whether I am going to be successful or not. We don't know whether we're going to be successful or not. Musa ibn Uqba, he mentions, he's got a book called the Maghazi, which means the, the various different expeditions that the Sahaba undertook with the Prophet ﷺ. So in there he's mentioned that they think that Ibn Rawaha cried. This was the moment when he, the moment he cried was when they were about to depart for the Ghazwa to Mu'ta against the Romans, in which the three Sahaba died, if you remember. Ja'far, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, and then Zayd, radiallahu anh, they had to take the flag from one another. So his family cried when he was crying. And then he said, Wallahi, I'm not crying because I'm scared of death. Because remember, he's got a battle in front of him. Or that I feel for you guys. That's not what I'm crying. I'm crying because of Allah saying, wa in minkum illa wa riduha. So I'm getting close to, he's focused on the hereafter. Can you imagine that? You know, you're going to a battle, you could die. So the thoughts would be, what have I left behind? 
I'm going to lose the world if I, if I don't survive. If I become a shaheed, then I've lost the world, I've, my family, so on. That's one concern. No, his concern is for the hereafter. Allahu Akbar. That's why Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, whenever he would recite this verse, he would start crying and he would say, My Lord, I don't know whether I'm among those that you're going to give safety to or those that you're going to just leave alone in there. Uh, Abu Maysara, whenever he would get to bed, he would get to his bed to lie down, he'd say, How I wish that my mother had never given me birth. His, mother, his, his wife says to him, Abu Maysara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you so many favors. He's done so much good to you. He guided you to Islam. So why are you worried? You know, having, being a Muslim is so valuable. So he said, yes, that's right. But then Allah has also made it very clear that we're going to have to go across the hellfire. But he does not, he said that we're all going to have to come there, but he's not mentioned that we're going to get across. It's, certain, it's certainty for everyone that they're going to come to the hellfire. But there's no certainty that we're going to, who's going to get across. That was the way they were thinking about it. That's why it's related from Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, that the commands of Prophet ﷺ, when they would meet one another, one of them might say to the other, you know that you're going, we're going to come to the hellfire. You know that you're going to come to the hellfire. He said, yes. So then he would say, but have you received any kind of assurance or news that you're going to get across it and save yourself? He said, no. So then why are you laughing for? It's like, why are you so excited for? I mean, they weren't doing any sins, so that's why they were just censoring one another and laughing too much. If you went to somebody and said, why are you laughing for? Like if we go to people and say, what are you laughing for? You're going to come to the hellfire. You don't know whether you're going to get across or not. I think the first thing that we need to talk about is like, why are you committing this sin? Why are you doing that right? They weren't doing any sins. So that's why that was not what they were complaining about. They were complaining about just laughing a lot. We have to worry about the sins that we commit and that we get engaged in. We've got a long way to go, but may Allah have his mercy upon us. I can't see what else we can do. I don't know what else if it, without that. So what exactly does wurud mean? Right? وَإِمْ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا If you look at the various different mufassirin, they tell us various different things. Um, so wurud, according to a group of sahaba, it means murur. It means that passing, as we've been saying, trying to pass over. Right? There are a few other views about that. It'll be presenting yourself in front of the hellfire. But at the end of the day, you have to get across. Abdullah ibn, I think it's Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, says that if the people of Jahannam were given glad tidings of a day in the future or whatever, or even the number of years in this dunya, they would be very, very excited by that day. Because anything that you can expect to come is considered close now as opposed to something you don't even know. Like, if you're waiting for something, you didn't, just don't know when it's going to come, that seems so much further away than if you're told, okay, you're going to get your visa in six months. Now, if you don't know you're even going to get a visa, that's much more difficult than if you know that, okay, it's going to take six months, but you'll get it. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make it easy. Allah, make it easy. Allah, make it easy. We will stop here, inshallah. We will see uh, if we can complete the rest in the coming session. أن الله أسست أس أن الله أبتكت أس وأخر الدعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. جزاك الله خير for listening. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless you. And if you're finding this useful, you know, as they say, do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others. جزاك الله خير. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.